today, and thank all of you so much for coming. And Delmar, I almost I found myself kind of wishing we had taped oh, yes. we taped our pre talk. Yes. It was so hilarious. Uh, but there's probably some stuff in there y'all don't need to hear, so that's fine. <laughs> but uh, but I, I, you know when we do these things, I mean it's true. I, I write about art, and I write about artists, and I. I make that distinction a little bit because I feel like there's something, you know, of obviously long-standing value in, you know, art critique. This is amazing, this is why, this is what's successful, you know, whatever, an objective conversation. But so often, the conversation that you might then have with the artists themselves so enriches your understanding of the work that it becomes just absolutely essential, I think, to the full experience. And so even though this work is really, you know, compelling and sort of grabby, and it's beautiful, but it's not pretty, and it's the kind of thing that when you stare at it long enough, you realize there's like entire worlds at the back of it that you didn't even see at first, much less in a JPEG. And, you know, even though you talk, and we'll talk a lot about the brightness of the palette, that's the brightness of the palette that made it to the front. Mm -hmm. But behind it, there's physical and physical layers of dark world that also have all these, other, and everything in there has all this meaning. It's, it's autobiographical, it's geopolitical, it's art historical, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's formal, it's all these things. So, uh, it's, and in some ways, even though it's based on events from your life, the emotional experiences are completely universal. So, you know, there's a lot going on in the picture, but there's a lot going on in the work. And I feel so excited for everyone to have the opportunity to hear all about those things from you and how they all kind of interlace and then manifest into the, the work on the wall. So if I were to say to you something silly like, Tell us what we're looking at. <laughs> That's kind of what I mean. Like, okay, you're looking at these paintings, I've made them. But I, I really am so curious, I guess out of all the places to start, maybe it's gonna be a choice and you can choose between the imagery and the symbolism or the, 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 the role of color and the reason why color has that role whichever place you'd like to start, but I think those are the, those are the two most sort of um, urgent questions about, about them. Thank you, Shane, for your great explanation. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you everyone for coming, first of all, and thank you, Shane, for being here. Thank you, Roshira and Nama, for having this great space for artists, Iranian, Iranian-American artists to present their work. It's uh, really valuable for us. I want to start with, um, well, this series is uh, for the last three years that I made this series, basically where COVID started. And meanwhile, in Iran, there were uh, a lot of injustice happening. And the only way I could connect with Iran was through social media, so I was constantly like um, you know getting all these news and then keeping all these pains and emotions inside and I uh, really kind of paralyzed me in a way but then um, gradually during COVID because of our solitude I started uh, doing some works that comes from the urgency of it so that's why uh, those smaller works were mostly uh, I did it during um, COVID, which I had to just um, flush it out, all these emotions, so it had to be small, and I wanted to finish it, and I wanted to do next, the next, so I can kind of feel the relief. And then in, uh, right after COVID, in uh, September 2022, um, well, uh, Women Life Freedom happened, and uh, until now, and when that happened, uh, I had some really dark months, uh, which I kind of felt that I'm paralyzed. I can't really connect with these people, and I'm so useless. So 
I thought that my best reaction to it was uh, having a big space, working on a huge space and throwing myself in that space. So that was my reaction. I couldn't sleep at night, so 2, 3 a.m. I was waking up, brush a stroke. Just brush a stroke, <laughs> work on it. And so these days, uh, I didn't have any plan for any drawings or anything. I just, um, it came out of darkness. So a lot of them, it starts from very dark backgrounds and I built it up and adding more and more color. And for some reason at the end, I felt that, oh, uh, I'm adding water to these lands. And I realized that, I mean, when I'm talking, uh, right now I can connect all these uh, little reasons of why I added these water during COVID and during the woman life freedom, I was going and walking a lot along the rivers and I felt kind of calm. And then I realized that, oh, maybe because water is the only way to connect lands, so I could kind of questioning borders. And in my imagination, I was creating this world that doesn't have any borders and people are free um, to move. Um, so that was kind of, uh, the reason uh, how these uh, bigger uh, pieces uh, came, came up. About the symbology of these works, I think um, in Middle Eastern or maybe Eastern um, art or maybe philosophy or um, in aesthetics, there are uh, some, we deal with we have a lot of poems, we grew up with lots of poetry and uh, so poetry is also, there are a lot of symbolism embedded inside and I think one of the way we could uh, share our feelings was through symbol. Uh, for example, uh, um, fish, I, I work with fish a lot even in my sculptures and my paintings and fish is that in Iranian culture is a symbol of life. I wanted to bring this life. I wanted to uh, have it. It's, it's. I wanted to bring out to the world, kind of like I'm sending this to my people in Iran to to continue <coughs> to be strong. I use different symbols. Uh, bird a lot. Before maybe 15 years ago, when I was back in Iran, in Iran I was uh, painting. And not any figure. Figures were all angels, and they were all over the world, over this utopian cities, and flying over. Because I couldn't even imagine that I can uh, have. I mean, I didn't even. I couldn't even um, paint a um, female figure in my painting. So that was another reason that we have to use uh, symbology now um, in our art back in Iran. I think, thank you for that. And it, you know, it's so interesting because um, I have a side a side thing. Uh, that's a, a, a book I wrote um, called Zen Psychosis. But the, the point of the book is that it exists as a, it, it's a dream journal, actually. But the question was like, if you just read a compendium of all of my dreams, could you learn about me the same way if I wrote a straight, you know, conventional memoir? And the answer is kind of yes, right? Because it's the truth that's coming out of yourself. But in that, there's a lot of these kinds of symbolisms. And you know, in in Jungian psychoanalysis, water represents the subconscious. And like in every place on earth, birds represent freedom, right? And so it's so interesting to me that, uh, and, and then the idea of having to kind of sublimate things into symbols because just saying it out loud could get you in trouble, to say the least. And one of the things we laughed about in the pre-talk was your relationship to the female figure. And it was sort of like, these, you know, the, the naked woman in these images is not only a kind of um, Edenic, you know, sort of Garden of Eden, source of life, power of life, power of the, the female spirit. It is all of those things. But it's also like, kind of a big middle finger to the forces of oppression. This is like, I'm here and I can do this. I escaped and I'm free to put boobs in my paintings. 
right? And it's deadly serious, so it's a little funny to laugh about, but it's, you know, when you, and so that when you, when you know that and you turn around and you look at someone like, you know, the pregnant figure in that, making eye contact with the viewer, you know, there's, there's so much more in, it, it's already a powerful image of kind of, um, I don't want to use the word primitive, but just to say like, you know, uh, ages old kind of ideas of, of life and community and sacred power and like places, you know, a lot of the, the sort of secret groves and forests and things like that are places where oracles were, where magic happened, and or mythologies and origin stories and all this stuff. These locations are those kinds of places. Um, but I, what I appreciate is that within um, digging into all of that, you're also making them, I think, sort of modern. Because if you think about sort of, you know, Olympia, right? The, my name, my name is Olympia. The most scandalous thing about that painting at the time was that she was making eye contact with the viewer. That was scandalous. Like, who does she think she is? She's looking right at you. And you are probably a man in that context, right? And she's looking right back, like, yeah, this is. And so the idea that, you know, and so there's there's pieces that are from the poetry of this culture, the art history of that culture. And of course, as a professor of art, you're synthesizing all of these different influences. But um, so I, I, I think that, you know, that's where some of the kind of um, dreamlike quality comes from, is because you're sourcing these things like poetry and art history. But also, I would love to hear more about um, the, the process of the dark to light. Because when we spoke about it earlier, it was so beautiful how you talk about that's a, pro a personal process in your life. But in each one of these paintings, it's the literal way that you made them. It's a dark ground. And then the color goes in afterwards. And I'm, I'm curious how intentional that was. Like, or did it just kind of happen? And if you could talk about that a little bit more. Well, there was no intention, I can say, and especially for big, big bigger works. But for some reason, I, I wanted to bring that yellow, orange color to to my work to just pop it out, to shout out. And, and you talked about eyes. It's, the, it's very interesting because this is the first series of my paintings. And also in my sculptures, I never used eyes. I have made a sculptures hybrid forms for maybe seven years, and they none of them had eyes. And I didn't know why, but I knew at the right now I can say it loud that, oh, I didn't want anyone to get into the character right, of those The eyes are the windows to your they're soul that's like, they're shut. They're, yeah. Yeah. Right. I didn't, I wanted to secure myself, my beings, and that's why they, none of them had eyes. I remember I was going to therapy at that time, and I was, and I was uh, asking the therapist, like, what is going on? Am I okay? <laughs> and, uh, she was like, one day, hopefully, <laughs> I don't know, maybe. But the good thing was that I was very honest with myself. I didn't want to do it, I didn't do it. But then after uh, Woman Life Freedom, there was this courageous act happening right now in Iran that I just wanted to open my eyes, my people's eyes, and show like boobs and bodies and showing that this is us and uh, we're gonna celebrate our existence. We are not going to live in the dark anymore. We're going to just celebrate it. And that's why I use the, the last piece, which is the name of the show, Land is Feeling, Color is the Remedy, is the piece all the way back, the pink, the very pink yellow piece. And I wanted to bring that pink, which uh, is, to me, is a little bit uh, more Western color, that pink. We don't really use it in uh, Persian miniatures or Persian Iranian art, but I also really, really wanted to bring that cute, girly, Barbie color and show that this is us, we're going to use it and have it 
all in all phases. Yeah, I love that, and I think that kind of fusion is like you, you know, because I it, it's true. Like everything that needs to be branded as female is pink. And I'm kind of like, I get it, I get it, it's pink, no, it's for women, thank you. But at the same time, I love that color, I can't help it, right, it's amazing. So, it's okay, even though, but it's, it's so, um, uh, it's so what it is, it's everything that you described. But what's interesting to me is like, that you would think of that as something Western, I mean, in other words, that East-West fusion is just like one more thing that's happening in the work. And that's, I'm sure, partly intentional and partly just because you, you're an artist and you live here and this is your milieu and you absorb it, you know, yes. you can't help it. Um, but you're still who you are. And so a fusion of those things is exactly what would happen after spending so much time here and in, in the art world here, um, specifically. So that's funny. Uh, you mentioned Persian miniature paintings, and that is something I wanted to talk to you about as well, because there is uh, formal issues aside for one second. The, the thing about, I mean, I'm not, an, I'm not an expert, and I always say this so that people understand how not an expert I am, but I, most of what I know about it, I, about the dynamics of that part of art history, I learned from reading the novel My Name is Red, which is a murder mystery, a sexy murder mystery that takes place in a court of miniature painting, right, in Istanbul. But the idea that it wasn't just paintings. Every painting had a, a generational lineage of the story that it told, and you were choosing to tell that story in this context, and that had meaning, and the way that you were good at it meant that you were good at it. Like, this was the gold standard, and there's a metric. How much you insert of your own flourish and your own personality would, would like lower your score. And here, and you know, it was like the goal was to be was to continue its perfection in the generations. And it was um, even though we might look at it and think because a lot of it was flat and hyper detailed and obviously not particularly big, it's got miniature, right, work title, that, that it somehow was like a motif, like a decorative thing, but it was not. It was like very serious cultural uh, sort of commentary or very involved involvement. And then you come here and the art world here is like almost the opposite. It's like if any part of your work looks like anyone else's work, we have a problem. This has to be all you, who are you, you want to see, what makes you different, what makes you special, what's your style. And it's so different um, for the way that art functions in the society. And I'm so curious to hear um, just your relationship to that. Like, did, is that the tradition you studied, or studied specifically, or was it more just like something that was kind of in the air? Like, and how do you think about it now, and like, just all of that? Well, um, I, was, uh, I got my first MFA in Art University in Tehran, and uh, basically I, I, in, I got introduced to art through miniature. Uh, museums, all museums mostly, they had miniature, they studied uh, Persian um, uh, art history, like two, three courses uh, while studying at um, Art University in Tehran. And, Beautiful, and also my uncle was a miniature artist. My dad was a miniature artist. So um, there is a there is a sort. So that's why uh, I think a lot of these paintings has something deal dealing with a story behind it, and uh, and it's very interesting because I didn't feel that way until one of the, I was telling you the other day that one of our friends, Nancy Evans, was here, and, and she. She was uh, walking around, and she, all of a sudden she asked, uh, "Who are they? Uh, it looks like there's a story behind these uh, these characters. Who are these characters?" And all of a sudden, I just saw myself in all these uh, paintings, which I never ever thought about that. Because when you're in the studio, you're just so inside that in your own world, and you're just trying to make and trying to deal with that, that you don't know what it is about. 
but when you have it here, uh, it kind of helped me myself to understand my work better, where it comes from. And um, for example, in most of my paintings, if you, in Persian miniature, uh, we have a, um, we have a, maybe an expression, and they, they call it like um, um, high um, horizon line. So the horizon in the composition, they put the horizon line all the way up, so all the happenings are coming in the front. So in the foreground, you have this hap you have everything happening, and then in the background, you have a little bit of the sky and the elements of the, the, the land that you were in. And I think in all my works, I, I can see that. There's this before, after, and in each uh, painting, I want to tell the whole story. And sometimes they are embedded in the layers that is right now hidden, but it's not totally hidden. It's there because I lived it. I uh, kept some parts, removed it, added. So to me, there is a there is this story which is kind of look like illustration, but in more in a painterly way. But you could see. I mean, yeah, it's very easy to imagine these as book plates to something. Yes. Right, and that something would be that maybe not quite a fairy tale, but certainly some sort of fantasy like origin story. Maybe it's some kind of lost people, of the, you know what I mean? Yeah, it definitely, uh, it definitely has that quality. I love what you said about telling the whole story, and it's funny about the horizon line because it's true. It's like if you put the horizon line up here, everything tumbles towards you. If you put the horizon line down here, everything goes out that way. If you put the horizon line where it really is, it's like, <laughs> the world already looks like that, whatever. It's funny, there's a lot, for anyone who saw the otherwise, in my opinion, absolutely terrible movie, The Fablemans, the last terrible. scene. It's terrible. The last scene, David Lynch plays John Ford, and you know, and basically has basically the conversation we just had with him like word for word. And it's hilarious because it's uh, true, right? And he's like, look at that painting. See where the horizon is? That's interesting. <laughs> look at that painting. And, and so when you were starting to talk about that, but I, I think there is something, and I, we tend to refer to like that high horizon action down here as, as flatness, even when it isn't really flatness, but we think about that as a flattening. And I think that's one of the characteristics of it too. It's like, so then when you're dealing with the painting as an object, everything is the surface. Like all of this is here because that's the space you're in. And the horizon's like back there. Well, this is this has an interior frame, which is beautiful, by the way. But that kind of idea. And I love what you said too about how it's all back there, even if you can't see a lot of it anymore, because I think we could all agree you can still feel it. Yeah. And so it's it's great to hear you sort of acknowledge like you're not imagining it. Like there, mm -hmm. if you get a sense that there's more going on in these paintings than you can see, there it is. Right? Yeah. I, I think if you look at this painting from this way and that way, there's some difference because I played with light a lot. I was changing the light source and started playing the different um, different directions and for each of them I, I work and let it sit. Sometimes it takes like two three months and I'm working with two or three at the same time because I, I want to have that movement. I really wanted to all these paintings to, to, to so that the viewer as well as me feel that moving because we are moving to, toward freedom. We are moving toward freedom. Like the fish here, I wanted to give that that moving that I really like. And they're moving their roots. They're moving their roots here and there. So it's also another so like label. In motion. Yes. Like if they stop moving, they die, actually. Mm -hmm. Right? And I mean also too from a well, I mean, from a Western art history point of view, the sort of beautiful goldfish and its relationship to Impressionism, for example, is very is a very rich tradition, and that's just kind of also in there automatically looking at it because you can't not see that in you know the beautiful painting of goldfish at this point. And I do think that there is kind of 
what I would say impressionism, I think about um, like Lily Pond specifically, mm -hmm. right? The Lily Pond paintings where it's so, there's so much of it in such a forced perspective that it's almost like abstract paintings, yes. except you, it's yes. very obvious what you're looking at, but that feel of pond, right? That the kind of is also tilted forward a little bit and the way all that works on the eye. I mean, although that said, I need to know about the hot pink man bunny beasts and the women who have tamed them and ride them. Because um, I think out of, out of, they all have an incredible dynamic vivaciousness to it, but then occasionally they're also funny. And this is really yeah, especially funny, the eyes so especially funny. the eyes, like the one that's like, I guess uh, this is what we're not here, maybe but, not here. Right, but like that pink again, right? Like she's in the pink, she's tamed these bizarre, or, you know, sort of forest creatures. They have a, yeah, a little bit of a Greek mythology quality to them, the half man, half creature kind of thing. Um, it's obviously a matriarchal society, and yet, you know, it, you know, her her load is uh, wildflowers, right? So it's not like a like a hunting scene of you know, right? So it's it's this it's a very interesting idea to me. Are, is that referencing anything, or is that just a, like a dream you had? Where what are they? Have, do those creatures have a name? Um, Have you started I writing? I really like to yeah. <laughs> make hybrid forms, uh, even in my sculptures. Uh, I like to uh, to create forms that half are animal and half are human, because I want to question just being a human, and that is not like something special. And like that's that is one way. And, and it's interesting that you mentioned about uh, Persian miniature because in Persian miniature you have uh, uh, these uh, characters called Yano that um, you know the prophets after Islam uh, prophets are are being carried with that uh, hybrid uh, animal which we see a lot but um, I didn't even thought about it when I was making it but I feel that I wanted to bring other. Um, species that doesn't even exist, but they are along. They are coming along with us through this journey. I feel that there's a journey in a lot of them. There's the there's this before and there's now. There's this back in another land. That's what I'm, and and then they're all here in front of us, like looking at us. They're they're still, and it seems that they they don't want to they don't want to go. They they are there. And so these animals are like also they, I didn't want to have any gender and try to kind of play a, a, a little bit with gender. Uh, so not in my mind they're they're men. Yeah, right. they're <laughs> they're <laughs> wrong. They're they're like, so apologies, so love. Yeah, but that's, that's what they yeah. um, that says more about me than about you. I'm gonna own that. But you know, there's a there's a part of me that and I think, you know, that's sort of like, I, I, I'm writing the story in my head, right? Um, of these women and, the, you know, the taming of the creatures that live in their lands that for whatever reason they're leaving and they're, you know. Um, but I think what's what's beautiful about a painting like this, um, that aside, which I'm, I'm not going to get over, but it's amazing, is that it's, it's so literal, right? It's like, if you wanted to have you know, the symbolism, psychological analysis conversation. It's like, well, here, here, you, here you go. I mean, there's a clear shadow land back there. The direction is clearly, okay, towards us, but away from it, which they're accomplishing by following a river. All these, you know, spiritual, mythical beasts that have not completely tamed, or at least have consented to be hopeful now. And, Flowers is the thing they're bringing with them, which is another sort of mostly universal symbol of life and love and passion and springtime and fertility and all the things. And that's Eastern and Western art history. 
And so, it, and then, you know, the sun or light source, which is explosive and not contained or completely friendly, but also bright and, you know, just throwing its energy out there has text inside of it, which says, it or doesn't have it's any not, meaning, they're just doodling in Farsi. I just wanted to have some intention that it comes from that land right. that has these types of alphabet. Right, right. It's because it, um, like Iranians know that that P, some people ask, is it Arabic? And I said, in Arabic, we don't have P. So it's Farsi, because P is only existing Farsi. They have P, not P. So what I love about it is that even if you, like I don't read Farsi, but I, I see that it's text. So I'm going to just accept that there's meaning, something in there, right? Like I, so that the sun is more than the sun, even if I don't necessarily know what it says, which is a, a completely separate question for a completely separate venue, but it has to do with how text-based artworks work outside of the context of who speaks the language they were written in, right? Like everyone loves Lawrence Wiener. Are they still good if you don't read English? I don't know. Right? I mean, it's, they act as imagery, but, but I think in a case like this, that's, one, that's an answer to that question. It's like, you know it's text, you know there's meaning, whether you can access it or not. It's it just the there. beauty of uh, Farsi. I, I miss sometimes writing, and there are a lot of uh, Farsi writings, maybe some of them there are meanings, like that one is written, uh, sand means woman, it's spray paint that I added at the end. But uh, most of it is just my doodling uh, that doesn't necessarily have any meanings. Uh, so the beauty of it and the visual, the visual aspect of it is something that is more important for me. Yeah. yeah. No, but I appreciate that because, like I said, it's just one more thing because there's this other conversation about text and you know, in art. And, um, and that's kind of what I mean when I'm saying, like, there's so much going on in here that you visually and uh, I literally a lot is literally happening on the campus uh, which I which I love and so I guess um, okay let me check the time so I've talked to you for like three hours and now nobody wants that okay so we can talk about and I want to leave some time for questions too in a couple minutes um, okay so uh, question what is the chance that people uh, in Iran will have to see any of this work. Is there any, I mean, in person probably not, at least not right now, but like, are, are, do you have open communication channels with the art community there? Like, what is, what is that like? Have they seen your work? What do they think? Your friends at home? Well, um, they probably can see through social media. But maybe I, mean, I don't know. I mean, yeah. how would it do on social media? Even <laughs> here, they get some yeah. Thank you, Instagram. Yeah. yeah. So um, I think when I am um, I'm far, there's this illusion of what is happening over there because we are uh, just receiving the news through social media, and we don't know what is exactly happening over there. But um, I just wanted to bring that energy, this collective energy of all of us, like all the Iranians, that each of us can just do a little, little things. Like, um, and these are uh, some of the collective energy that we are uh, sending to this whole universe. It's not a, we don't have a very big world. We're just so little and we're very close, actually. Yeah. So I feel that uh, each of our act is doing something. Well, I love what you, the way in which, like, it, not only in our conversation, but in the materials for the show, that you talked about using this much color as a kind of act of courage um, on different, on a couple different levels. For one thing, you know, just as a painter, a ton of color is scary. You know, as a painter who hasn't worked in color, at least in public, this much before, but also, the courage that's kind of the resistance of like, I see this darkness and I'm gonna fight it with color. And so that there's that dimension of it as well. Um, 
and I, I, I just would love to hear you, and I think everyone would, to talk a little bit more about what, what, that, what that is for you. Because the color is so, it's so easy to talk about the imagery because it's so narrative and so interesting and so symbolic and magical and mysterious. But really, color is the thing that's going on in these meetings. So maybe before we open it up to questions, just, um, talk a little bit more about that emotion because it wasn't just, I feel happy, and these are my happy colors. It was like, I feel dark, but I'm gonna fight it, right? Well, I think it was very uh, personal journey for me um, to accept that this is what, I, what is happening right now, and I have to accept that, and I have to go through it by myself without like been, you know, sharing it with anybody because nobody knows where I am, like, where, where I'm situated, and I felt that the first two months of um, Woman Life Freedom for me was like pitch dark. I was hopeless. I was, and then, uh, and then I I started just working on myself and by like, walking on the mountains, and just by uh, situating in myself and believing that this being, our being, is going going to elevate the world, like. And if, uh, just little, um, like little light, little even like texting to friends that everything's gonna be fine. But maybe it's not even real. Maybe it's real, but just saying that and being positive about it, I felt that it's gonna help me to survive and others. So that's why I started like. And again, it was not even intentional because the color, the, these paintings were dark. But I, I was not satisfied. I was not happy with it. I didn't want um, that side of me. I wanted a very brave, free woman. A free woman who has experienced freedom and now I can um, be, I can represent freedom. Yeah, oh my god, I love that so much. And I think that is not only courageous, but it, I think it does what you want it to do. You wanted it. That's the message back, right? Like this is possible, right? It's the place you can reach, you know. Um, it's really moving. I would be emotional if I was just quietly in the back of the room, but they're all looking at us. Um, amazing, God, thank you, and thank you for being so. Um, oh, I mean, thank you for making the work, but thank you for being so open and willing to talk about it because I know it's fascinating for us all to hear, but I know it can't be that easy because you have to revisit some, some hurts to get to it. Yeah. yeah, no, no, it's amazing. I'm glad we spoke first, though, because, yeah, I had forgotten the thing about no eyes in therapy. That was, um, and, but to go, to just know, to go from no eyes to that woman yeah. like this is, is something. I mean, really, that's a, that's, that's a huge big deal, so. For me, it was a big shift. For me, even like painting it, and I changed those two characters like maybe five times because I also wanted us, by looking at their eyes, to be able to go through their characters. So it was not that they're looking, or to me, they're not looking at somewhere, they're looking to the horizon. They're, they're looking, looking here. Yeah, they're looking yeah. Um, to the, to this, to the present. Like what's yeah. even past us. Yes. What is, yeah. yes. So. That's amazing. No, and there's a softness, but also a, like what's that crazy, you know, witch weapon <laughs> that she has. It's like, you know, there's a softness and a beauty and also a like, don't mess with that quality <laughs> that I just absolutely am <laughs> obsessed with. They it's are strong. strong. Yeah. yeah, and you can tell pink notwithstanding, and I think that's what makes the pink effective. Because it's like, yeah, in my pink dress, but actually, like, I have undertaken this insane journey to lead my people to freedom on the backs of mythical creatures, and we're in the water to throw like the goblin set off, and you don't even know what we've been through. But yeah, in my pink dress, I love that. right? And I love that so much. I mean, I really. So obviously, that's my favorite. But I can see. Something like how captivated I am with that, I can see that happening for someone else with every single one of these pieces. Someone's going to look at that and it's going to scream 
freedom to them, or it's going to remind them of something or someone or a story. And so there's that dynamic that I'm having could happen with every single one of them because each one of them is also, they do belong together, but they're also different. And I think that's where your friend was like, what's the story here? Because it feels like episodes from something, something bigger. Yeah. Excellent. Fantastic. Oh my god. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Uh, so we're going to have time for questions. Raise your hand if you have one. More of a comment than a question is also OK. That's a joke. <laughs> yes, because everyone always is like, this is more of a <laughs> I'm a uh, more of a Perfect. I'm yeah. yeah. I mean, first of all, it's it's so amazing to see your work because I saw Delmar's work in Iran back in Iran, like we came at the same era. So wow. it was amazing to see your first solo show in the US and also see your other shows back in Iran. Um, but one thing that was really interesting to me was uh, one of your, I mean, the, I mean, I know that you use like a lot of, um, you know, metaphors and also like different lands and dreams and at the same time, uh, I like the element of time and space a lot in your work um, and especially actually in some of your work uh, that you use spray paint, paint for example, in that uh, was really amazing because I was seeing, um, because right now people in Iran are using spray paint to actually yes. write that like big and you're actually yes. using it on your you know, your dreamland. <laughs> so that kind of like play of time and space was really interesting for me as a, like a portal situation. So I wanted to see if you can elaborate a little bit. Yeah, thank you very much for asking. Because uh, I think also use the material, the material that you're using is very important. And the materiality of uh, the work is actually very connected to the psychology of why you're doing it. Uh, like when I came to US in 2013 to 16, 17, I was making like rough sculptures, like putting my body in the world because I was angry. Yeah. I was angry, I was hurt, I was traumatized, and I had to get all these out. But gradually, I started like going back to myself, like honoring myself, on, you know, uh, respecting myself which we didn't have in that society. And um, so the material that spray paint, you're totally right, that is uh, actually, it happened during September, October, when Women Like Freedom was happening. And I was angry, I was like making a call card for, you know, going on the street. And one night I just took it out and got this magenta spray paint and, and I started like writing, woman on the middle. <laughs> So yes, the act of using a spray paint is very political. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. Thank you. Right. That's good. Yes, twice. I, I yeah. so enjoyed this. It's Thank you. That was, I had done years ago a visionary performance piece called Fish Swims, and I love your whole sense of lateral movement. And I had just looked up that the fish has six degrees of freedom. And I, I wanted to ask how those levels of freedom coming from, a, I guess it was your father, who was a miniature painter, yeah, that, well, if you could say a little more about that, with the patriarchal aspect influencing your work. Well, patriarchy. <laughs> 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 well, I think since uh, since uh, when I was young and I started like professionally work as an artist, going to different classes, I always was very kind of um, um, I made my own world. I was not even sharing with people. So I think I kind of created my own reality and my own um, um, Medina, which was not even close to. Uh, the outside world and the society until it came to the point that I had to show my new sculptures and the gallery and they didn't let me do that and of course I did but um, so there, there was this always I, I wanted to create 
my own world without knowing, uh, without anybody knowing about it. Thank you. That's, that's one idea. very good response. Thanks. Right. So I think that's what a lot of good responses mm -hmm. for the new generation. Yes. Okay. Hi. Um, so I really wish for everyone, like right now, talking about fish, I would have seen your other painting that once I came to your studio, it was this very oh, big fish in front of right. me, uh, a canvas, and there was a um, pink fish. It was a pink fish like actually meters with a fish. blue background and <laughs> someone was someone was writing the fish actually. Yes. Wow. Oh my god. That was a very that was different the color transformation years. Very different <laughs> color <laughs> and then it was, yeah, yeah, sorry, but it was one of uh, your artworks like that um, we shifted Basically, it was the, I feel like it was a couple of years uh, or three years ago before you started the series yes. that I saw that and I was like, oh my god, there's a revolution. Well, it was like two wow. wow. years ago. Wow. Like, wow. 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 I still want that piece. Exactly. One day I'll get rich. Okay. <laughs> coming out of their belly button because I was feeling it. I was feeling that in this land, uh, something is happening. I am removing some parts of me and some new parts are growing. And what is it? So I made this two meter gigantic fish whose part of the, her body was also coming out. The guts was coming out and she was moving and this girl was whining about her. So, yes. Yeah, we would have we would have fun instead of it's true. <laughs> oh. You would be a girl uh, next time, but we but just because that I mean, it's so that that's kind of what I in the very beginning when I was mentioning. There's all these things that are happening simultaneously because that's so personal to you, but it's also so accessible to anyone seeing it or hearing about it. And it also is having all these conversations with different art histories and, and politics and the female experience and the human, you know, just like every, every way that you want to, uh, you know, make a life on earth into sentence. There's a piece of it that comes out in a work like that and in these and all at the same time, um, which I think is hard to do in a single still image on canvas, right? It's not a movie. You don't have two hours to tell everything. You have to tell it all at once. And um, that's not easy to do. But also, I think you've sort of cracked it, the one way to do it. And that's kind of, I think, all of the things we've talked about today are in there. And some that you see and some that you don't, but you feel all of it. And I think that's, um, that's where the power of the work comes from. All of, the, all of the things that, we, that have been brought up and more are going on. And we could probably start over and talk for a whole hour and barely repeat ourselves, right? There's just so many things. We could have to decide to have a whole other version. So congratulations, anyway. It's a show. Um, and last call for questions, comments, please. Oh, me? Yeah. Um, that, well, it actually alludes to, because we were talking about this other piece that's not here that's large, because uh, we had met earlier and we were talking about um, large scale paintings and how freeing it is to work large. I was just curious if you had intentions to um, expand on this series and, or maybe do go big. I'm already working <laughs> <laughs> on right, so I think I need bigger and bigger and bigger. I, mean, I don't know how big I'm going to go. I think we all need girls for you. Oh, Do we not so need girls for you? Yes. Give me that wall. Please. I mean, if I have a wall and you want Give to make a 200 foot pink exploding oh, fish yeah. goddess on it, oh, I want that. I want that. I think LA needs that. Okay, there's a few people in this room who have the ability to make that happen. Let's get on. Yeah, maybe the wall. <laughs> No, but I, I love that. I think bigger, you know, because that's just one more thing 
that is going on in the work. Like, bigger is not always better. But sometimes, in the case like this, the scale is just one more thing that's, on, that's a kind of freedom that yes, exists in the work, exactly. right? Yes. And so, yeah, the small ones, the drawings, they're really intimate and really beautiful, and they have their whole own dynamic. But to know that working larger is not just because you can, it's like that's part of the same story that's yes. unfolding to you. Yes, that's part of being free. It's part of being free. Having free space to work. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.